Welcome to Wednesday night. It's so good to see your smiling faces. Who is so excited that Jesus loved us enough to come to this earth and give us the opportunity to not only know him, but to experience the Holy Ghost? And if you haven't experienced the Holy Ghost tonight, is your night. <laughs> okay, so let's worship with us as we sing. And we're going to pray. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this day and this night to not only be here and worship, but to give all honor to you and all glory to you. Let us have our hearts and our minds be open tonight for your word and let us apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. Stephanie, a surefire way 
to shake off those blues, to shake off that depression, that anger at work, that one customer that really got you going is sing. And don't just sing, but praise. Just worship God. I mean, this evening, I kept yawning. I was yawning more than I was talking. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, that spirit of worship, that joy just lifts up your soul. And you can't think of anything but how God is so good. Amen. So right before the ushers come up to take up our offering and our tithes tonight, we wanted to remind everyone that there is youth class and there's marriage matters. And then the general session for Bible study is still here in the sanctuary. All right, let's bow our heads. Thank you, God, for this amazing Wednesday, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this amazing week. No matter how it's going to end up, God, we trust you. There will be victory. There will be glory. There will be miracles and signs and wonders. Your kingdom has not stopped. Thank you, God, for everything that you've blessed us with. The gifts, the anointings, the vision, the wisdom, the energy, the refreshing. We love you, God, so much. Thank you for being the center of it all. In Jesus' name.
even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing one more time, waymaker. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that is who you are. 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 I'm so glad that he's a way maker, amen. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. Even when I don't see him, he's working. Because he never stops. He never stops. Help me, somebody. He never stops working. Amen. If we can keep that at the forefront of our mind, I believe that our lives will be so much more hopeful and our lives will be filled with so much more joy. Amen. I want to just say a great big thank you to uh, all of the people who uh, rush in here right after work. They just barely get off of work and they come in here and uh, they're able to come up and jump on the platform and play and sing. So I think it'd be a good idea if we just give these folks a hand. Thank you so much. Great job. Great job. Amen. Good job, ladies. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen and uh, ladies for singing tonight. And you can go ahead and go on down. All right. Amen. I appreciate that. I know what it's like trying to get off work and then head for church uh, in order to get here on time. If I could get, uh, Brother Dwayne, if you would shut that off on the way down that that, uh, that baptistry, that would be great. Amen. If you could do that. All right. And uh, before before we pray tonight... Let's see, we have Marriage Matters, right, that can be dismissed. Is, uh, is there a hyphen also? Not tonight? Okay. All right, so Marriage Matters, you can be dismissed, those of you that are in Marriage Matters. And the rest of you all are in here with me, all right? And I'm so glad that, uh, that you're here. Amen. I want to pray tonight before we begin, and we want to ask the Lord just to be with us, and I want to pray for... Uh, a pastor, Wesley Poe, who is going in for surgery, for heart surgery. His wife called me uh, this past week and requested prayer. He goes in on February the 19th, which will be this week, and that the Lord would just touch him and help him through this, uh, this heart surgery. He has two um, blocked arteries that they need to repair. So let's pray for him. And then also pray for Brother Sean Early. I talked with Brother Sean earlier today, and he called and asked, he said, you know what, every time we get ready to go in for prayer, you're always there. One of the pastors are there. You can't be there now, but uh, we believe in that. And so he said, would you pray for me over the phone? And uh, so he goes in for surgery also, I believe, on Monday is when he goes in. So just pray for Brother Sean Early. They're doing a total hip replacement on him. And when he was younger, he had a terrible, terrible accident, almost died. 
they had to put lots and lots of hardware in him because he was so broken up in this uh, truck uh, construction accident. And he has been in pa pain for, for years and years, and many people don't know that. But he works every day uh, as a, uh, a cement finisher and laborer. Um, and uh, so hopefully this will get him out of some pain, that the Lord would just help him with that. Amen. So would you just bow your heads and let's pray for Brother uh, Pastor Wes Poe and also Brother Sean Early. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you tonight. And I thank you because uh, you are God that heals. You are God that hears us when we pray. And I pray for Pastor Poe, Lord, that you would first of all give uh, peace in the hearts of his wife, that she would feel the peace of God that passes all understanding. I pray, Lord, tonight that you would touch uh, Brother Poe as he goes in for surgery, that you would keep your hand upon him, that you would direct the surgeons to be able to do the things that are right. I pray for Brother Sean Early tonight, God, that you would touch him and comfort him and his family, and, Lord, that you would guide and direct the surgeon that will be working on him this next week. I thank you, Father, for bringing a complete and a whole recovery to both of these men. Our trust is in you. Now, Lord, as we turn our hearts uh, to the Word of God tonight, Give us receiving ears, give, a, give us receiving hearts and obedient lives to be able to embrace the Word of God. For Lord, you said as we hide your Word in our heart, then it has the, capa the capability of helping us not to sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say amen. Join with me in asking this question, what does a Christian look like? Look at the one next to you and say, what does a Christian look like? I'm going to paint a biblical picture here tonight as to what a Christian looks like, all right? Now, don't leave. Don't leave. You say, I just knew I shouldn't have come to church tonight. No, no, you're in the right place at the right time for the right word. Amen. It's going to be good. Let me say it again. It's going to be good. <laughs> you may be seated. The Lord bless you tonight is our prayers. What does a Christian look like? Well, this is going to be a two-part uh, message, so in case you don't like this one, you'll know for the next week uh, that uh, you'll really want to be able to come for that one, all right? Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, break this up into uh, two different parts. Uh, I remember reading a story several years ago about a Baptist preacher that uh, decided, uh, he and his wife decided that they were going to get a brand new dog. And so, ever mindful of their congregation, they knew that that dog had to be Baptist. That dog had to be Baptist. And so, uh, they visited the kennel, they explained their needs, and they finally found a dog that the kennel owner assured them would be exactly the one for them. So, the owner brought the dog out to meet the reverend and his wife, and then he said to, to the dog, Fetch the Bible. And that dog jumped up from where he was at, ran over to the bookshelf, and uh, looked feverishly through the bookshelf until finally he located the Bible, and then he grabbed it off and brought it back to its owner and laid it there. Oh, they were so amazed at what that dog could do. And they said, uh, watch this. He said, now, he said to the dog, he said, find Psalms 23. And the dog dropped down to where the Bible was at, put it on the floor, and it began to paw through the pages. And finally, he came to Psalms 23 and pointed it out with his paws. The pastor and his wife were so impressed at what this dog could do. They said, man, we have got to have this dog. And so that evening, uh, they brought the dog home. And later that night, several members of the congregation came to their home. And, and so he was happy and eager to show that, that dog off to his congregation members. And so they begin to show him how that the dog could fetch the Bible and locate several passages within the Word of God. The guests were so impressed, and then one of them asked, they said, but does he do regular tricks? Does he do anything just regular like a dog? And so the owner said, well, I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. And so the owner, he pointed at the dog, and he said, heal! And he said, they said that that dog jumped up on the chair placed one of his paws on the pastor's head and began to howl. The pastor looked at his wife and he says, Oh, no, this dog is not Baptist. He's Pentecostal. Yeah. 
you say, why would you even tell that? Because I thought it was a great story. <laughs> Amen. I tell lots of my Baptist pastor friends, thank you for that. If you'd like to give a courtesy clap for that, that would be great. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Amen. That was kind of really a courtesy clap too. All right. And I tell that to all my Baptist pastor friends, and they laughed about that just like I do. So tonight, though, we want to talk about what does a Christian look like? What really does a Christian look like? Is there a certain look? Is there a certain uh, way that they walk? Is there a certain way that they dress? Is there a certain way that they um, conduct themselves? And the answer to all of these is yes, 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 and yes. There is a way for all of those things that are there. And uh, so I want to direct your attention. You don't need to stand, but uh, I want to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 6, verses number 9, down to verse number 13. And Sister Mary, okay, I, I will take my coat off. I, I walked in and she says, are you feeling depressed and dark tonight? I said, no, why? She said, because you're all in black. So I will take my coat off. Does that make you feel better? All right, lightens things up just a little bit. Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9 through verse number 13. The Bible says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Let's read it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Or amen. This prayer is... is uh, probably my favorite prayer in the entirety of the Word of God. Uh, it's known as the Lord's Prayer. I, I, I like it because um, there's a song entitled The Lord's Prayer. I, I just love it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I won't, I won't sing it to you, but I just like the song. It's just so awesome, and it's so powerful. And I guess the reason why I like it so much is because it's the prayer that Jesus told us that we need to pray. He said, pray after this manner, or after this manner, this is how you pray. And so he give us a pattern here as to the manner of our prayers. Or in other words, it seems that the Lord is saying, this is how you do it. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer. Matter of fact, I have I've recited the Lord's Prayer for years. And uh, but I think that the deeper meaning behind the Lord's Prayer is that there is a pattern that is there, and when we follow that pattern for the Lord's Prayer, then our prayer is complete, and our prayer really, uh, it, it, it does some things that the Lord wants it to do. Um, again, I've used the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for many, many years. And as beautiful and as poetic as the words are, the deeper, more profound meaning is found, as I said, in the pattern that it establishes to help believers learn how to pray. If you ever say, well, I, I run out of things to pray, go to Matthew 6 and begin to look at the Lord's Prayer and begin to pray the pattern that is there. You say, well, I, I don't know what to pray. Do you have needs in your life? You pray, thy, you pray give, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, are you struggling with temptation? Lord, deliver me from temptation. All right, that's the pattern that I'm talking about. And we'll, we'll talk about and we'll teach about the pattern of prayer at another time. But tonight, I believe that the Lord has shown me in this Lord's Prayer an indicator of the character and the way every Christian should look and the character they should possess in their life. There are five things that the Lord has pointed out to me here. Uh, as far as what does a Christian look like. See, you thought I was going to talk about clothes and dress and hair and all that kind of stuff. And I might do that after a little while. But there are five things here in this passage that the Lord teaches us as to how a Christian is supposed to look. And that's the title of my message. What does a Christian look like? And there is a look that the Lord wants us to have as a Christian. Um, you know, I, uh, he, he wants us to, to have that certain look. And when people look at us, they need to know who we stand for and who we serve. 
when people look at us and when people talk to us, they need to know who we live for and who we serve. When people look at the way we dress, when people look at the places we go, when people look at our actions and our attitudes, and the way that we can, even the way we raise our family, the way we treat uh, those around us, all of those are indicators as to who we serve and if God really has true uh, authority in our life. And so tonight, allow me to, to show you what the Lord has shown me in this particular passage of Scripture. A little boy, uh, he asked his dad, and I've told this uh, story several times in times past, but he asked his dad, he said, Dad, what is a Christian? And so the little boy or the, the dad, being a reverend or a, a deacon or an elder in the church, he began to use all kinds of theological terms as to describe what a Christian was and what a Christian is. And finally, whenever he got done with his theological dissertation, the little boy looked at his dad with a puzzled look, and he said, Dad, do we know any of those people? <laughs> and uh, the dad uh, then realized that i got to put it in some terms that this boy is able to understand. And so what really does a Christian look like? As you know, Paul put it this way. He said, we are living epistles, or an epistle is a letter. We are living letters that are read and known of all men. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Or in other words, when people look at our lives, our lives are writing a letter about who we're serving and about how we feel about the one that we're serving, and it testifies to others around us about that. He was saying this, the world needs to be able to look at us and clearly see the characteristics of a Christian. So let me let me begin uh, in, with Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, and five things that are identifying characteris characteristics of a Christian. What are they? Number one, you have your pencil ready? Number one, a characteristic, what does a real Christian look like? A real Christian recognizes and reverences the name of God. A real Christian they recognize and reverence the name of God. Look at it here in verse number 9. He said, uh, after this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be the name. The word hallow means sacred. It means to render sacred. Or in other words, when you say the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ, it's not just a flippant thing. It's when you say, I'm living for the Lord and I'm doing what the Lord wants. It's not just like a Sunday thing or a... Uh, a Monday thing, but no, I'm doing my best every day to be able to live for the Lord because I hallow, I, I realize He has a sacred name. And that name, because it's been called upon me whenever I was baptized, and I called upon His name when I was baptized, then there is responsibility that, it, that goes with that. And that responsibility is made to make sure that we reverence and we recognize and we make sacred that name of Almighty God. My dress, my speech, my actions, the way I treat my family, the way I handle my money, the way I serve my employer, the way I treat my employees, all of these things, they, 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 and any other thing that pertains to life, we seek to hallow or to make sacred the name of God by doing the things He is pleased with. This is why if you are an employer, you should not be taking advantage of your employees by, by making them do things or by, by being unfair to them, all right? You shouldn't work and 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 work them and just drive and drive and drive and never give them any compliments. You never tell them they're doing a good job. You never give them any extra rewards. No, as a good employer, the good employer will recognize good work and they will reward that good work, and especially that Christian man, that Christian woman who is a boss or who is an employer, they're going to do their best to make sure that the people that are working for them, they know that they're appreciated. Why? Because the Lord lets you and I know that we're appreciated, amen? The Lord tells you that, that He loves you and He cares for you and, and He's proud of you and, and what you're doing, all right? Now, the employer also needs to be straight up with that employee. If they're doing something wrong, don't go and tell everybody else, but go to them and talk to them. 
talk to them by themselves. All right, how about the employee? The employee, you hallow the name of God, and you demonstrate that you are a Christian by, by, by showing up when you should, by being on time. You shouldn't show up at the last minute and then put on all your gear and then go ahead and get ready and finally have your coffee and your donut or your salad or whatever it is you eat in the morning. No, you should do that ahead of time so that when you get there and it's time for you to begin work, you are working. Why? Because you are representing the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a Christian. That is what a Christian looks like. They should never have to worry about you stealing anything that is on the job. They should never have to worry about you stealing time. Uh, I mean, if you get 30 minutes for your break, don't come back in 45 minutes. Amen. Now, there may be times when you a, a train caught you or whatever, but it should not be a regular thing. I'm talking about being a good employee. That is what a Christian looks like. If you've been hired on there at, I don't know, let's just pick a, a good let's just pick a, a good number, all right? You've been hired on at $35 an hour. I'll work for $35 an hour. Anybody else? Bring it on. Come on with it. All right. Say so you've been you've been hired on at $35 an hour, and you've been working away, and it's been great. It's been wonderful. It's been fantastic. All of a sudden, there's another person that is hired on. And they're making $36.50 an hour, and you find out about it, it's not your place to try to correct that that is there. You agreed to $35 an hour. And it doesn't matter who gets what else. You agreed to $35 an hour, and as a Christian, you need to demonstrate Christianity and say, that's what I'm going to work for. Now, if you have a problem with that, then you go to the employer. And you sit down and you renegotiate. Negotiation is a wonderful thing, isn't it? it? It really is. You don't gripe. You don't fuss. You don't cuss. You don't do any of that. But you renegotiate with them. And if they say no, you either say okay, and you put a smile on your face, and you go forward, or you leave that day and you find another job making $34 an hour. <laughs> Or less, yes, yes. You understand what I'm saying? And Jesus demonstrated this even in the New Testament. He said that, that there were people that were hired for a certain wage. And he said they began to work all day, and they were just giving it all that they had. And then another person came in at the 11th hour, just about an hour before quitting time, and they agreed to pay that individual the same wage that the people were paid that had been there for 10 or 12 hours. Now, in our own humanity, we say, that's not fair. Well, it doesn't matter what we think. We had no control over that. We agreed to work for that amount. And that is up to that employer, that person that is paying the wages, if that's what they want to do. And Jesus said, he said, this is none of your business. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He told those laborers, he said, this is none of your business. You agreed to work for that. Now, you agree, and you be quiet, and you go ahead and do what you're supposed to do. That is what a Christian looks like. Oh, it's quiet in here tonight. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the aisle in just a minute, all right? <laughs> just so we can lighten it up in here a little bit. Hallelujah. And so they, we recognize and reverence the name of God. Exodus chapter 20 it lists Ten Commandments. You remember the Ten Commandments? Notice he didn't call them the Ten Suggestions. He said, these are commandments. And I've had people say, well, that's why I don't go to church, because I don't want to be told what to do. Really? There's one young man who was tired of his parents telling him what to do. He said, I'm sick of my parents telling me what to do. I'm going to go and do what I want to do. I'm going to join the Marine Corps. Ha, ha, ha. Or, I'm going to join the army. Ha, ha, ha. Brother Randall, do you still tie your shoes the same way they taught you in the army? Did they te teach you how to tie your shoes? The reason why I ask that, I know they did because your dad said, I still tie my shoes the way they taught me in the army. And they said, this is the way you do it. This is how I had to do it. And so the point is this. 
that all of us are going to have someone that is going to tell us what to do. And it's when we learn to be under submission and under authority, then God will give us authority in our lives. And so uh, Exodus 20, there, it lists the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to point you at Exodus 20 in verse number 7. And this is the third of the commandments. And it says, thou shalt not, read it with me, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The message translation puts it this way. No using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter, God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. And what does it mean, what, do I, what am I saying whenever I say the characteristic of a Christian is to recognize and hallow the name of God? It means to be careful how we speak using the name of God and how we speak about God. As you know, in the Old Testament, the Jewish men and women, they were so concerned that they would take the name of the Lord in vain that they would not say the name of the, the Old Testament name of God. And so thus we have several uh, discussions and and agreements and disagreements as to what the Old Testament name of God was. Some say it was YWHW. That was the uh, that was just the the letters that were there, and they wouldn't they, and and they put those there. And some say it was Yehovah. Others say no, it wasn't. It was Yahweh. Others say it was Jehovah. And you'll see all of those throughout the Old Testament. But they were so concerned about taking the name of God in vain, that they would not speak that name. In the New Testament, of course, the name of God is Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to recognize and reverence and hallow the name of God? It means that we are careful to think about what we speak and live our lives according to his name that has been pronounced upon us. It means to be respectful. It means to be obedient to the laws of God and the way of God. Our thoughts, our actions, our conduct, our speech are to hallow the name of God. You say, well, I just thought it meant, you know, we shouldn't take his curse, his name. Obviously, that's true. You should not be saying God and then you know, all right? You should not be doing all of that. And, 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 and isn't, this, isn't this really, really kind of uh, uh, funny? The people that do not believe in God, I've had people say, I don't, I don't believe in God. There's nothing about God. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. But when they get mad, the first thing they do is they say, God. And then they say, Jesus Christ, only they say it in a slanderous way. I'm like, why don't you say Lucifer, the devil? I'll tell you why, because they know that there's power in that name, and every chance the devil gets to slander and to bring that name down, he will do it, and people do that in their lives. I remember hearing one guy, um, and I, I, I think he was serious. He said, he said, whenever I was growing up, he said, I thought my name was Jesus Christ. <laughs> And you say, why? He said, because every time my mom got mad, she would say, Jesus Christ. Well, what she was doing was taking the name of the Lord in vain. We shouldn't do that. It's not right. I don't, I just, you know, I don't, I just, that's not right. But even more than that, we need to hallow his name by living the life that he wants us to live, by striving for that. So the question is this tonight. How are we doing in this matter of recognizing and reverencing his name in our lives? I ask myself that today. How am I doing with that? Am I really looking like the Christian that God wants me to be? The second thing that uh, is a characteristic of a Christian, what does a Christian look like? Number two, they reach for God's purpose to be established in their life. They reach for God's purpose to be established in their life. Let me say it one more time. Let's see if you've got it. Say it with me. They reach for God's purpose to be established in their lives. 
What's the first one? They reverence and they hallow the name of God. They reverence that name. They recognize and reverence. The second is they reach for the purpose of God to be established in their life. Verse 10, here's my scripture. Here's why I get this. Thy kingdom come. Matthew 6 and 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Read it with me. Thy kingdom come. Come on, help me. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I know you worked hard all day today. I'm, I'm working hard up here right now. So help me a little bit, all right? And so, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Do you see it? There is a reaching desire by those that are Christians to be able to know the plan of God and to have his kingdom in their lives. When I pray, many times I pray those exact words. Leave that up there if you would, Sister Rachel. I pray those words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes I just pray those words. You say, oh, that's, that's vain wrangling. That, that's just vain repetition. It could be, but if it's coming from my heart and it's just not coming from my head and I'm just thought up something and my mind is someplace else, then, then it, that it could be vain repetition. But if it's coming from my heart, no, it's not vain repetition. There's power in that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What you're doing is you are claiming the plan of God for your life. You are saying your kingdom up there needs to come down into this area here on earth. The will of God up there needs to come down in my life down here. That's what you're doing. I am praying your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth, in earth as it is in heaven. What it is, it's reaching by declaration and by submission saying, I know you have a plan for my life, Lord. I know you have a plan for my family's life, Lord. I know you have a plan for my church, Lord. And so I am praying that that plan that you have up there will be fulfilled down here, Lord, and that your kingdom would have its way. I'm asking that what you said in heaven, you will say it on earth and that we will embrace it so it will happen. This is why we can pray and preach with such certainty and power when we know the will of God and we know what the kingdom of God is. How can I know his will? You can know the will of God and you can know what the kingdom of God is, first of all, by the word of God. Thy word, thy word, the word of God. When you read the word of God, it will tell you what the kingdom of God is about. It will tell you what the will of God is about. But second of all, we can know what the will of God is by the spirit of God. We know it's the will of God for people to be born again. Why? Because John 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. We know it's God's will for people to be baptized. Why? Because Mark 16, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. We know it's God's will. We know it's God's will for people to receive the Holy Ghost because in Acts 2 and 38, it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. How many is everyone? Help me, somebody. Everyone, which means if you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, then you haven't done what God has told you to do because every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and then here's what he said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we can preach that with power and with demonstration. And literally, when we do this, we are causing the kingdom of God, what he said up there, to be brought down to where we're at, to where we're at. And when men and women hear that and they respond, then all of a sudden they are born again, they are baptized, they repent, and God begins to have his way. We preach holiness because we know God is holy. We don't serve an unholy God. 
We serve a holy God. He is a holy God. Somebody say that with me. He is a holy God. You say, yeah, you just want to put all these rules and regulations. I have not said one word about rules and regulations here tonight. I preach to you, I've taught to you the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 15, it says, Be ye holy as it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I am holy. Romans 12 and 1, the word of God says, I beseech you, and the word beseech there, it means I beg you. I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, not your spirit. You've heard people say, well, God don't care how my body is. He only cares about the heart. No, Paul said, I'm begging you. I'm begging you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. Here it is, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And then he goes on to say, this isn't something that is unreasonable. He said, which is your reasonable service? I get amused at men and women when they say, well, I don't think that I should have to dress a certain way. But yet, they have no problem going to work at McDonald's and wearing a McDonald's uniform. Come on, somebody. Now, you could go in there and you could say, you know what? I don't want to wear this McDonald's uniform. I like Burger King's uniform a whole lot better. You know what they're going to say? Go to Burger King. You say, well, I'd be offended then. And I would say, they're hateful individuals. Why? There are guidelines. There are, there are directives. There are, there are, there are uh, uh, principles that are there that nobody gets offended at. Really, they just say, no, if, if, if I don't want to be there, then I'm not going to do it. And there is a culture in the church that is unlike the culture that is in the world. You shouldn't expect to be able to live and act and dress and talk and all of that like the world does. You say, well, I, 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 I think I need to blend in. No, if you're blending in, then you probably are not living the way that you ought to live. If the world is fitting you, then you, my friend, are the wrong size. And I've had to tell myself that. I've had to say, well, I don't think I should have to. And I don't, and, 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 and all of this. And I'm at, finally I come to this question, what does it matter? Do I love the Lord enough to be able to do this? And, and not say, well, the preacher told me or the church said or this and that. No, you've got to get it down inside of your heart uh, so that it's not the preacher, it's not the, pre it's not the Sunday school teacher, it's not the church, it's not the denomination. But God himself has spoken to you uh, and said, live this way. I saw it in the word of God. Uh, I receive it. And then you have to embrace that and go forward. But what about when we do not know what his will is? When I've studied the word and I just can't get it. I've heard the preaching and I just can't get it. Well, then there is the spirit of God that will speak to you. And understand whatever the spirit of God says, it will not be different from this word of God. It will be backed up by the word of God. Because it was the spirit of God that, that authored this word of God. Do you know, or, or do what you know, rather, until, you, until God shows you what else to do and, it, and something else? Our problem is we, we're going along real good, and all of a sudden we hit this, this cog in the road. One preacher, uh, my friend from Canada, he's been preaching for 50, 60 years. He'll be preaching along, and he'll say something that will kind of go a little bit against the folks. Say, 40 miles out to sea and hit a stump. And sometimes we are going and we are sailing along the sea of God's Spirit, and all of a sudden we hit a stump out there, and we just stop. And if we're not careful, pretty soon life begins to take over. And, and, and we just say, well, I, I can't go any further until I know this. Why? If you waited until you knew everything about the car that you're driving, you would never drive that car again. But you're smart enough to know, 
I have a key fob. I have a key. I know where the push button is. I know where the, the key is at. I know where to put the gasoline in, and that's all I need. I know where the brake's at. I know where the reverse and where the drive's at. I know where the gas pedal's at. Vroom, vroom, let's go. Why don't we use that same idea when it comes to living for God? Well, I just, I just don't understand. I've got too many questions. So what? We all have questions. But don't allow your questions to undo what God has placed already in your heart and what he has shown you. Go forward until God shows you something else. Don't let the devil get over on you. Don't let him just slap you down and say, well, you don't know this, and what about this, and what about that? Here's what your answer needs to be. Shut up! I don't know everything. I don't know all of the answer to those things. But I do know one thing. There was a day that I met the Lord. I repented of my sins. And he washed those sins away. When I was baptized, I felt him when he came into my heart and baptized me with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I know that God has shown me this way. And until I see something else, I'm going to continue here. I'm not going to allow the questions as to why and what if and all of that to negate what God has given me already. Simple. So you will let the Spirit of the Lord deal with you. There's sometimes I don't know what to do. You know, you know, you say, what do you do then, Pastor? Here's what I do. Remember, the second thing that we're talking about is we're reaching for God's purpose to be established in our lives. Sometimes I don't know what that purpose is. Sometimes I don't know what God wants to do. Sometimes I don't know what he wants to do for my family. I don't know what he wants to do for the church. You say, really? Yeah. Because guess what? Before I'm a preacher, I'm a human being. And I'll never get over being a human being until one day I say, hasta la vista, baby. And I take my last breath. Then you can say, He's no longer a human being. He's no longer a flawed individual. Now he is perfect. So what do I do until that time? And I don't know. Here's what I do. I say, thy kingdom come. (laughs) Thy will be done. One translation puts it this way. Come thou kingdom of God. Be done thou will of God. Oh, Man, that just puts a different twist on it, doesn't it? When I'm praying and I don't know what to do, I don't know what God wants to do in the congregation, I begin to pray for the congregation, Lord, would you touch this church? Lord, I don't know the direction that we need to take. Lord, there's some things that we're, we're facing and we don't really know what to do. Lord, would you please help us, oh God? And suddenly I, I begin to say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Oh, Lord, come with your kingdom and let it be established where we're at. Be done, thou will of God. I'm yielded to you. And I'll pray that prayer until God gives the answer, until God brings his kingdom down where I'm at, and until what he has said there is said down here, and I know what the will of God is. A true man or woman of God reaches for God's purpose to be revealed. In their lives. The old poem went this way. The pencil maker took the pencil aside just before putting him into the box. And he said, there are five things you need to know. He spoke to the pencil. Before I send you out into the world, you need to know these things. Always remember them and never forget and you will become the best pencil you can be. Number one, you will be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in someone's hand. Number two, you will experience a painful sharpening from time to time, but you'll need it in order to become a better pencil. Are you here tonight and you're going through a sharpening? And you say, well, I just feel like giving up. No, God is sharpening you. He's getting you ready for the next thing that he's got planned for your life. Number three, you'll be able to correct any mistakes that you make, that you might make. 
because there's something on the top of that pencil called an, help me somebody, eraser. The Bible says that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He cleanses us from all sin. Number four, the most important part of you will always be what's inside. Never get so high and mighty thinking, well, look at me, I'm dressed right. Man, I'm looking good. Oh, man, I look the perfect part. My hair is right. My, 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 my suit is all pressed just right. I, I'm, I mean, I am, I am looking good. I'm looking good. Be careful because pride goes before destruction. And the most important thing is not what you see on the outside, but it's that which is on the inside that makes the biggest mark upon the lives of others. And number five, on every surface you are used on, you must leave your mark. No matter what the condition is, you must continue to write. Some of you have stopped writing. You said, I've run out of lead. No, no, no. You refuse to allow the Lord to sharpen you because you've just kind of bucked up against him. I don't like this. You've had criticism from others. You've had others say, well, well, this, well, why is this and why is that? And they pulled and pulled and pulled. And you didn't realize that uh, it wasn't God that was pulling on you. That was the enemy that was using these others to pull on you and try to get you off of your game, off of his game, if I could say that, if you can understand what I'm talking about. And so you've stopped writing. And the Lord said, you've got to keep writing no matter what the situation. The pencil understood and promised to remember. And then he was put back into the box with purpose in his heart. When we reach for the kingdom and pray his will to be done in our lives, suddenly we live with purpose in our lives. And it's 7.58, and now you know why I said this is a two-part lesson. Next week, I'll finish this. You say, well, you only got to the two points this week. Yeah, but next week's going to go a whole lot faster. Actually, the week after next, because next week is a business meeting, right? So is that, is that correct? No? So I have one more week. Am I right or wrong? Okay. I thought I was wrong, but really I was right. That's what I tell my wife all the time. All right. So uh, it will be a week from today. What does a real Christian look like? They recognize and reverence the name of God, and they reach for God's purpose to be established in their life. Let me pray for you. Father. Right now, I pray for each and every person who is here, those that are watching online. I pray for myself, Lord. I pray that each of us would remember to hallowed be thy name. May we understand, Lord, that we bless your name and we reverence and recognize the authority of that name by the words that we speak, by the way that we act, Lord Jesus, by the things that we do. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would help us each to understand that. I pray, Lord, that we would each reach for that purpose, that kingdom of God, that will of God in our lives. Though each of us have are a part of the general will of God, the universal will of God. For you said it's not God's will that any should perish. Lord, that is the universal will of God. But yet there is a specific will that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, we are like that individual pencil. We are sent to make a mark upon every service surface that we come into contact with. I pray that that mark that we make would be one that is indelible, but Lord, that it, was, that it would be also one that testifies that we are followers of Christ. I pray for those that are weary today, Lord, those that are feel like they're the, the pencil that's in the midst of the sharpening. Lord, I pray for those that have questions and they've thrown up their hands in despair. I pray that tonight that you would speak peace to their heart. 
and that you would tell them to get up and go forward and quit worrying about the things that they don't know. Focus upon what they do know and go forward. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody say amen. All right. Looking forward to seeing you all Sunday. I will finish my third message, uh, Three Tales of a Lion. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to be preaching from this subject, The Lion Must Roar Again. The Lion Must Roar Again. So looking forward to seeing you all. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more people to baptize. God bless you. Pray that the peace of God that passes all understanding would rest in your hearts, that the joy of the Lord would be your strength, and that you would walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed. God bless you tonight.